Hi, this is the recording to accompany the slides on the lecture on blood circulation. Let's start. So in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the pathway of systemic blood vessels. We're going to continue on with the unique features of um, the fetal circulation. And we're going to then move on to physiological uh, terms, cardiac physiological terms, and then we're going to finish with control of um, cardiovascular function, both neural and hormonal. So when we talk about the um, blood vessels of the systemic um, circulation, the main blood vessel coming out of the left ventricle is the aorta. So what you have is you have this system where this is the on the other side of this is the SL valve, the aortic valve, and then um, you've got the left ventricle. So blood, um, when the left ventricle contracts, then blood enters into the aorta. When it enters into the aorta, you can see that the um, first couple of things that branch off the aorta are the right and left coronary artery. And so these supply the actual layers of the heart. And then the aorta then continues on upwards, the ascending aorta, and then it does a U-turn in the aortic arch. And you see these branches over here, then supply the neck, head, um, and sort of upper body region. And then after the aortic arch, it goes down and becomes the descending um, aorta. And in the descending aorta, it splits off into the thoracic aorta, which is um, the descending aorta above the diaphragm. And then the abdominal aorta, which is what the descending aorta becomes when it goes beneath, uh, below the level of the diaphragm. And at the diaphragm, there is a hole called the aortic hiatus that the um, aorta, the descending aorta, passes through. When we look at the blood supply um, in the brain, what happens is we've got this arterial circle or the circle of Willis. And what this is, is that it's a continuation of the internal carotid arteries. And you've got this circular, um, um, the circle called the circle of Willis. And so in that circle of Willis, you've got several different branches, um, art arterial branches coming off it. So the first one is the anterior cerebral artery, um, which supplies the um, frontal lobe of the cerebrum, followed by the middle cerebral arteries, that uh, artery that supply the um, blood to the temporal and parietal lobe, just behind um, the frontal lobes. And then you've got the ophthalmic aor uh, artery that supplies blood to the eyes, the anterior communicating artery over here that is formed of um, from the right and left um, cerebral arteries, right? So this is the anterior communicating artery. You've got the posterior communicating artery over here, um, which branches then branches off uh, from the posterior cerebral artery, and then um, we've got the basilar um, artery over there. When we get to the systemic veins, what we have is we have um, the systemic veins collect blood from the systemic uh, capillaries to deliver and return them back to the heart via the um, right atria. And so what you have is the blood in the brain gets collected into the dural sinus, um, all the blood from the areas above the heart, so superior to the heart, returns to the right atrium via the superior vena cava. All the blood from um, levels below the heart return to the right atria uh, via the inferior vena cava, and then the blood um, that supplies the heart once it goes into the um, capillaries and gets collected, it gets collected into the coronary sinus, and then it goes into the right atria. 
veins can either be located deep in, um, in the body, in which case they're deep veins, or they can be located but just below the skin, in which case they are superficial veins. The next part talks about the fetal circulation. The fetal circulation is quite different from the circulation after birth because um, as a fetus, the fetus doesn't breathe and the fetus doesn't eat. And so what it needs is it needs a, um, a supply, a way to actually get oxygen and to drop off CO2. And again, a way to actually receive nutrients, to get nutrients and to drop off waste. And what it and the way that it does that is um, through the with the help of the placenta. So you've got here, this is the placenta over here. And so what you have is you have the maternal blood supply supplying the maternal part of the uh, placenta. And you can see that gas and nutrient and waste exchange can occur where um, the uh, maternal blood supply um, is in close proximity to the fetal blood supply. Um, and so within this, the, the placenta, we've got, as I said, the maternal um, um, arterial and venule, and you've got the two umbilical arteries that deliver deoxygenated nutrient poor blood from the fetus to the placenta right, because it delivers it from the heart and transports it towards the placenta. And then the umbilical vein actually collects oxygen and collects nutrients from the maternal blood supply and delivers it towards the fetal heart, okay? So um, in, in the fetal circulation, there are two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein and you've got the umbilical artery actually dropping off deoxygenated nutrient poor blood and the umbilical vein picking up oxygenated nutrient rich blood. We've covered these first three items um, and then I'm going to talk about the other three. So the first one is the ductus venosus. So what happens is as nutrient-rich oxygenated blood is picked up from the placenta by the umbilical vein, um, most of the blood goes into the inferior vena cava and bypasses the liver, right? Because in the in the fetal liver, it doesn't. The fetal liver is not as functional as the liver after birth, um, because most of the nutrients have been um, picked up and formed by the maternal um, circulation. In the heart itself, there is an opening in the septum between the right and left atria. So if we draw the heart over here, we've got the right atria, left atria right ventricle, left ventricle. And what happens is then there is this opening called the foramen ovale between the right and left atrium. And what happens is then that allows blood in the right atrium to actually go, most of the blood in the right atrium to actually go directly into the left atrium. And, um, there is um, still the AV valves between the atria and the ventricles, and there is still the semilunar valves between the ventricles and the great vessel. But what this, um, what this opening does is it allows most of the blood to actually go straight into the systemic circulation and less blood actually goes to the non-functional lungs, right? The blood that actually goes into the non-functional lungs, um, typically blood from the right ventricle goes into the pulmonary trunk, whereas blood from the left ventricle goes into the aorta. So even between those two great vessels, there is actually another, another blood vessel that connects the pulmonary trunk with the aorta. And this connected blood vessel actually diverts most of the blood that enters into the pulmonary trunk 
again away from the uh, pulmonary circulation into the systemic circulation. And this connection, this blood vessel connecting the pulmonary trunk to the, to the aorta is called the ductus arteriosus. Now in the fetus, blood goes from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart because the pressure in the right atrium and the pulmonary trunk is actually higher in the fetal circulation than the pressure in the aorta and the left, left atrium. And that's because most of the blood vessels in the fetal pulmonary circulation is constricted because the lungs are non-functional and that vasoconstriction within the pulmonary circulation increases the pressure within the pulmonary uh, uh, cir circulation and in the right side of the heart and the pulmonary trunk so that it's higher than that of the aorta and the left atrium. So a lot of the blood is diverted away from the lungs, away from the liver, which after birth is the, um, the main factory of the body. Now, at birth, what happens is the lungs start working. And because the lungs stop, start working immediately, immediately after, after birth, we want blood to start going to the pulmonary circulation and we won't we don't want those two shunts between the right and left atria and between the um, pulmonary trunk and the aorta to be functional so what happens is those two things shut down right so the foramen ovale which is the opening between the right and left atrium um, shuts to become the fossa ovalis, uh, ovalis the ductus arteri arteriosus um, shuts down to become a ligament, the ligamentum arteriosum. And then the ductus venosus, which um, bypasses um, blood away from the liver, also uh, constricts to become the ligamentum venosum of the liver. As well, when the baby is born, um, then there's no need for the placenta or the umbilical vein and arteries to be functional. And so the placenta is expelled from the uh, uterus of the mom um, after the, the um, fetus is, or the baby is born together with the umbilical vein and arteries. And that's why um, uh, one of the first things that happens is that the umbilical cord, which contains the umbilical vein and arteries, gets clamped down um, because there's no need for that to still be functional after birth, right? So you've got the ductus venosum then becomes the uh, ligamentum venosum. Um, the umbilical uh, vein and arteries um, constrict. The foramen ovale becomes the fossa ovalis, ovalis and the ductus arteriosus becomes the ligamentum arteriosum, right? And, and then after birth, then what happens, these changes then um, follow um, what's typically seen in adult circulation. In the next um, part, we talk about cardiac physiology terms. So you've got seven different terms over here. Some of it are, um, most of it is fairly self-explanatory. So let's start with the first one. The first one is heart rate. So heart rate is a number of times your heartbeats, right? Per, and, and it's always per unit time. So the unit time that we use is per minute. So how many times does your ventricles, do your ventricles contract in a given minute? And it's called beats per minute. Um, with each beat, how much blood leaves each ventricle? And that volume of blood that leaves each ventricle is called the stroke volume, right? And so it will multiply heart rate and stroke volume together, we have the cardiac output. And the cardiac output is devi defined as the amount of blood pumped out by each ventricle in one minute. Two, um, the next three, three terms are connected to each other. So we've got N diastolic volume, N systolic volume, and ejection fraction, right? So the end diastolic volume is the volume of blood that is in a ventricle at the start of contraction, right? So what happens is that 
the ventricle fills with blood um, during ventricular relaxation, during atrial contraction, and the amount of blood in the ventricle is as is at its maximum just before the ventricles start contracting. And so that volume of blood is called the end diastolic volume because it's the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of relax ventricular relaxation of ventricular diastole, right? And then what happens is the ventricles contract. And when the ventricles contract, blood leaves the heart. And the amount of blood that leaves the heart, sorry, the, um, the amount of blood that is left in the um, heart is um, the end systolic volume. The amount of blood leaving the heart is the stroke volume, right? So what you have is you have the maximum volume of blood is the end diastolic volume, and the end diastolic volume is the sum of the blood that leaves the heart and the blood that remains in the heart after contraction. And so you have ejection fraction. So ejection fraction is the percentage of blood that leaves the heart over the maximum amount of blood. Right, so um, at rest, what happens is the percentage of blood is about 58%. During exercise, the amount of blood that leaves the heart is much higher because you want more blood to go around the, uh, um, the cardiovascular circulation. Cardiac reserve is the difference between maximum cardiac output and resting cardiac output, right? When you look at the um, table on the top right-hand corner, you have just the different things that affect heart rate. So things like autonomic innervation, so how much sympathetic versus parasympathetic um, input there is to your heart rate, the amount of hormones that are floating around, your fitness level, as well as your age. So these factors then go in to determine your resting and your maximum heart rate. In terms of the stroke volume, um, the things that, def def um, that affect it is, again, the size of your heart, your fitness level, gender, uh, male or female, the amount of uh, contractility of your heart, like how much your heart contracts and how long it contracts for. Um, it also is determined by um, preload which is a function of the amount of blood in the ventricles just before contraction, as well as afterload. So we're going to talk about preload, contractility, and afterload in the next slide, right? So preload, contractility, and afterload determine, help to determine a stroke volume. Preload is the amount of stretch on the ventricles prior to contraction, and it's proportional to the amount of blood in the ventricles just before it contracts and diastolic volume. So the way that I think about it is um, um, when you actually um, have this and you pull this all the way back, if you pull it all the way back, the stone gets thrown further away, right? Compared to if you have this and you just pull it back a little bit, then the stone only gets thrown a shorter distance. So again, in the heart, if you fill it, then it means that the heart muscle can contract and um, eject a higher uh, volume of blood from the heart. Contractility is proportional to the stroke volume and inversely proportional to the volume of blood that's left in the heart, or ESV. Afterload is the force needed to be generated by the uh, ventricles in order to pump blood against the resistance of the, uh, of the blood vessels. So let me explain it like this. So you've got the heart over here, you've got the left ventricle, and then you've got the aorta. Now in the aorta, there is pressure. So the pressure 
is exerted by blood in the aorta, and it's exerted against the blood vessel walls here, and against the aortic valve or the semilunar valve. Now, when the ventricles contract, when the ventricles contract, what happens is left ventricular pressure increases. And once left ventricular pressure is more than aortic pressure, then what happens is the semilunar valve, the aortic valve opens and blood leaves the heart. Now you can imagine if the aortic pressure is higher than normal, then what happens is the left ventricle has to work much harder to, to, um, so that the left ventricular pressure is higher than that increased aorta, uh, aortic pressure. And so that's why people with um, high blood pressure, um, their heart actually needs to work much harder in order to get that aortic valve open and the aortic valve can only open if the left ventricular pressure is greater than the aortic or the systemic blood pressure, right? So what you have here is you have this, um, this uh, graph here called this Frank uh, Starling graph where you have left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So it's how much blood um, is in the ventricles just before contraction. And what you can see is as the volume of blood in the ventricles increases, then stroke volume also increases. And this is fairly linear up until a certain point. When we increase the amount of contractility or how strongly the heart contracts, then what happens is then stroke volume is increased. Right? So if you imagine the heart pumping harder, when it pumps harder, then more blood actually leaves the heart. So you've got preload, which is proportional to the amount of blood in the heart just before, it, in the ventricles, just before it contracts. You've got how much um, the myocardium actually contracts itself. And you've got the uh, pressure in the great vessels that needs to be overcome by left by the ventricular pressure in order to try to open up the semilunar valves so that blood can actually leave the heart. This one gives you an overview of um, what happens during um, exercise and maximum cardiac output. So this graph, this table over here, we've seen before where you've got the distribution of blood at rest. And what you see over here is you've got um, uh, heart rate um, in across the lifespan or in, in children um, when they're awake versus asleep. This is, <coughs> this is the um, um, target heart rate of uh, adults in increasing age. And then this graph over here, or this table over here in the bottom right-hand corner is actually quite interesting because what you see is you got the distribution of blood to different organs um, during three different conditions. So the first column is under resting conditions. The second one is during mild exercise. And the third column there on the right is during maximal exercise. What you can see here is that the amount of blood that goes to the heart stays steady, right? 750, 750, 750 mils a minute, regardless of what's going on around the brain and the rest of the body. The amount of blood that goes to skeletal muscle increases quite substantially, right? So from 1200 mils under resting condition to up to 10 times that under maximal exercise conditions. We've got, again, an increase in, in blood into the skin and an increase in blood to the heart. So what happens to blood in other parts? So when you look over here, the amount of blood that goes to the kidney goes down 
during exercise and even further during maximal exercise, the amount of blood going to the digestive tract again goes down during exercise and even more during maximal exercise. And the amount of blood going to other um, organs and tissues also goes down. And so what it means is that you've got this priority, sy priority system where you've got blood going into the heart in order for the heart to do more work. And um, you've got an increased amount of blood going to the skeletal muscle. You've got an increased amount of blood going to the skin. So that, that explains why when we exercise, our, our face can get red and we feel hot, right? Because the, the heat, the hotness that we feel is blood going into our superficial blood vessels in order for heat to dissipate from our skin. And um, what happens is that um, venoconstriction happens so that this systemic reservoir of blood that's in the systemic veins decreases from 64% to much um, less. And so you've got a lot more blood going in through the cardiovascular system, right? Because when you exercise, you're not making more blood. You're just actually, um, the blood is circulating around your body much quicker um, uh, than if you were not um, exercising. This is just an overview slide giving you an idea of factors affecting cardiac output. So cardiac output is the product of heart rate and stroke volume. And so you've got all these different things that affect it. When we go to our last section over here, this is the control of the cardiovascular system. And so we always have inputs from various parts of our body um, and um, that govern how quickly or how um, slowly our heart beats as well as the, um, our, our blood pressure. And so the inputs that we receive come from baroreceptors that monitor blood pressure or the stretch of receptors in, um, in um, blood vessels. And these baroreceptors are found in the aortic arch as well as in the carotid arteries. And so the aortic arch monitor the volume of blood leaving the left ventricle, whereas the baroreceptors in the carotid artery monitor the amount of blood that goes to the brain. And remember, we want the amount of blood going to the brain to stay steady, regardless of what else is happening elsewhere in the body. We also have chemoreceptors, again, in the same, pla in the same pla places, in the carotid um, artery as well as in the aortic arch. And what the chemoreceptors do is they monitor um, chemicals. So the chemicals that they monitor is the amount of um, oxygen in the blood leaving the left ventricle as well as the blood going to the brain and the amount of carbon dioxide, again, um, in uh, the blood leaving the um, left ventricle and the blood going to the brain. The uh, chemoreceptors that monitor CO2 are more sensitive than those that monitor oxygen, right? Because CO2 is very strongly linked to the amount of um, protons, so hydrogen ions, and hydrogen ions is very strongly linked to pH levels. And so you don't want the pH levels to change too much because that will upset the homeostatic mechanism balance in the body. Other inputs come from proprioceptors. So proprioceptors monitor the uh, body position, um, the position of the body and, and body parts. Um, so it helps to monitor the level of physical activity as well as the limbic system. So the limbic system uh, monitors uh, emotional state, especially for stress, anxiety, excitement, to see whether uh, the sympathetic nervous system needs to be involved. So you've got here inputs from pressure, inputs from chemical, inputs from body position, and inputs to do with the emotional state. That all goes to the um, brainstem. And what happens is the brainstem, you've got processing, um, you've got two paired cardiovascular centers that process the information. 
And then these uh, two vascular, um, cardiovascular centers in the brainstem and the medulla oblongata then project, project to the sinoatrial node as well as the uh, atrioventricle uh, nodes and the atria and the ventricles. And what happens is that output then controls blood pressure through autoregulation, through neural, uh, neural control, and through hormonal control. So you've got um, the neural control over here. Um, you've got inputs over here. And then that output goes via the parasympathetic nervous system as well as via the sympathetic nervous system. So you can see here with the parasympathetic nervous system, it goes through cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, which then ends in the sinoatrial node, where via the sympathetic nervous system, it not only can affect heart rate and contractility, but it can also affect blood pressure, as well as the amount of relaxation or dilation of um, both arteries as well as veins. In terms of the control of the heart rate, we've got here just what the sympathetic and the parasympathetic mechanisms can do. So the parasympathetic mechanism is um, goes through the vagus nerve, cranial nerve um, 10, and it acts via cardio inhibitory centers. Okay, so you've got here then the bottom, you've got three different graphs. This one in the middle is what happens when there is no external input. And what happens in the graph on the um, right, parasympathetic stimulation, is what you can see is that these action potentials slow down. So you've got these action potentials occurring regularly, and you can see with parasympathetic involvement, action potential slow down. With sympathetic involvement, it speeds up, right? So the parasympathetic um, nervous system acts via the vagus nerve via the cardio inhibitory um, center. It goes mainly to the sino, uh, the SA node, sinoatrial node in the atria. And what happens is that um, with the parasympathetic nervous system, it releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and acetylcholine binds to its receptors that is found on um, ligand-gated potassium channels. And so when potassium channels open, potassium leaves the um, cardiac muscle. And so when potassium leaves the cardiac muscle, repolarization is lengthened here, and when repolarization is lengthened, then it increases the time between contraction. It slows down heart rate. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, acts via cardio accelerator regions. And so what happens is that the sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine and epinephrine, both as neurotransmitters and hormones, and they bind to receptors that are, that are connected to sodium and um, calcium channels. And so those sodium and calcium channels open, more sodium and calcium ions enter into the cell. And so it shortens the repolarization uh, time and it speeds up the, um, uh, the heart rate because it decreases the time in between each contraction. So sympathetic innervation increases heart rate, parasympathetic innervation decreases heart rate. When we look at the control of blood vessels and blood pressure, what we see here is that there are three different levels of control. The first level, which is the quickest, is the autoregulation, followed by the neural mechanism, followed by the much slower endocrine mechanism. So auto means self. So auto regulation happens at the local tissue uh, blood vessel level. And so what happens is um, you've got normal resting condition, blood is distributed to various tissues as needed. And then when there's changes of blood flow, 
at the local blood vessel level, what happened is the uh, depending if um, there is a decrease in blood flow, then what happens is then uh, vasodilators are released to relax the precapillary sphincters right over here. And when these precapillary sphincters are relaxed, then more blood enters into the capillary beds, right? So blood flow is increased. On the other hand, when um, the local receptors um, detect um, too much of an increase in uh, blood flow, then what happens is vasoconstrictors are released and when vasoconstrictors are released, the opposite occurs. So when vasoconstrictors are released, what happens is again, these precapillary sphincters are constricted, are closed off, and so you've got less blood going into the capillary bed. And when you've got less blood going into the capillary bed, blood flow is decreased, and in both cases, homeostasis is, is um, restored. And so this can happen with individual um, capillary beds, um, and this is called autoregulation. The next level up is neural regulation. Neural regulation involves nerves. They are fast um, response, not quite as fast as the autoregulation, but they're also short lasting response. And so what happens with uh, the neural regulation is that it can involve either sympathetic or parasympathetic um, stimulation of the heart to reduce or increase um, blood leaving the heart, or it can actually um, result in the constriction or the dilation and increase in size of selected peripheral um, vessels in order to regulate flow of blood um, into various uh, capillary beds that's um, organized or that's driven by the nervous system. If the neural ner uh, mechanisms are not enough, then what happens is the endocrine mechanisms kick in. These are much slower but longer lasting response. And so you've got over here, in terms of the endocrine uh, um, mechanisms, you've got several different um, hormones that can be released. First one is erythropoietin in order to stimulate the production of red blood cells. The second one is the renin angioten and angiotensin aldosterone system, which leads to an increase in um, blood volume and therefore an increase in blood pressure. We've got catecholamines, um, norepinephrine and norepinephrine that constrict the blood vessels to increase blood pressure. We've got antidiuretic hormone, which reduces the amount of urine produced and so increases the volume of blood in the system to increase blood pressure. And then lastly, we've got the atrial natriuretic hormone, which is secreted by the atria. Um, and what happens is it leads to uh, an increase in um, um urinary excretion of sodium ions. And when there's an increase in sodium excretion by the kidneys, then an increase in water excretion also follows. And so when you have an increase of urine produced, then blood volume increases, uh, sorry, blood volume decreases and blood pressure decreases as well. Um, in some situations, we've got reflex responses to control blood pressure. So let's go through this. So when there is something that reduces cardiac output, this reduction of cardiac output is detected by both chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. So the baroreceptors monitor pressure, cardiac output decreases, it detects a decrease in the stretch of the blood vessels. When cardiac output decreases, what happens is the amount of oxygen um, in the blood also decreases and the amount of carbon dioxide um, in the blood increases, right? And uh, an increase in carbon dioxide then leads to a decrease in pH. When that happens, what happens is that um, the cardiovascular centers 
then process that information. It reduces the output from the parasympathetic nervous system by the inhibit cardiac inhibitory center. It increases the output from the sympathetic cardiac accelerator center and also increases the output to the um, smooth muscle of the blood vessels, right? So what happens is then um, vasoconstriction happens to increase blood pressure. And because the sympathetic nervous system is activated over here, then what happens is heart rate increases, stroke volume also increases, and that then leads to an increase in cardiac output, um, which then all these changes then increase the amount of blood running through the cardiovascular circulation in order to restore homeostasis. When the reverse occurs, when cardi uh, cardiac output increases, the reverse of all this um, system also occurs, but the end product is that homeostasis is also restored. In cases where hemorrhage occurs, so hemorrhage is when you have massive blood loss, um, this reflex cannot is not enough to actually control blood pressure. And so what kicks in is you've got those endocrine mechanisms. So as I said in the previous slide, you have an increase in ADH a release to retain water from the kidneys. You have an increase in erythropoietin release to um, replace the red blood cells that are lost through the hemorrhage. And then you've got activation of the renin and your aldosterone system to try to retain sodium and water in the kidneys as well. So these endocrine um, mechanisms um, help to um, maintain or retain blood over the long uh, period as hemorrhage occurs. And this last slide basically gives you the interaction of the circulatory systems with other body systems. Again, this is just a for your information um, so that you can actually see that this, uh, the cardiovascular system doesn't act independently of other systems. They're all connected together.